phrase such as, um, I am the door. Was Jesus literally a physical door? No, but he is the door in a spiritual figurative sense by which men must enter to come to him. Jesus would say things like, I am the good shepherd. Um, did Jesus ever wander around and use his staff to the sheep? No, but in a spiritual sense, he has sheep and he is a shepherd. Jesus would say things like, I am the vine. Was Jesus ever the true uh, vine? Yes, but was Jesus a literal physical vine that had stuff growing off of it? No. Jesus would use things like that to explain really difficult spiritual things. And aren't you thankful because sometimes um, I just need it dumbed down for me. Amen? Do you ever just sometimes need it dumbed down for you? That's the way I felt so many times in my life. Just, Lord, what is it? What do you want me to get? What do I need to understand? Jesus today is going to say uh, and explain, not from Luke, but we'll go to a couple other texts because I've got spiritual ADHD. I can't stay in one place in the Bible. I've got to use it all. All right, I like to go all over the place. So we're going to start in Luke. We'll wind up in John. We'll go back to the Old Testament. But Jesus is going to say that he's the manna that's come down from heaven. Friends, was Jesus literally a piece of bread? The answer is no. But we do feast and partake of Jesus Christ. We understand eating. We understand eating well, especially as Southern Baptists. We're the people that coined the term potluck, right? I mean, every chicken, we're going to eat the Baptist bird. We're going to have the potluck. Many of you today have probably already talked about what you're going to do for lunch. You looked at your spouse already and said, I hope Zach gets done at least in time so we can beat the Methodist out over to the Mexican restaurant. Like We've already planned what's going on for our fooding today. When I was young, I always wanted to play basketball. I always wanted to run around and stay on the golf course and do all these other things. And now I just want to eat. That's all I want to do. I just want to eat all the time. And then try to make myself not eat because we understand eating. That's what we do. Heard a story this week about an 83-year-old man in the McDonald's drive-thru. And he pulls up and he was taking forever to order and a young girl in the car behind him, she was mad. She was just giving him the business. And uh, it took him like 10 minutes just to order. Well, he gets around to the first window to pay, and she's in the back hanging her head out, just yelling at him and saying all kind of stuff. And he looks back at her and sees it, and he tells the lady at the window, he said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay for her meal. So he pays for her meal, and you know he scoots up in the middle between the two windows at McDonald's, and the young girl gets up to the window, and the lady working at McDonald's said, well, that man paid for your meal. And, you know, her whole, her whole tone changed. She looked out the window and waved and was real nice. And she said, thank you, mouthed it to him. And then the man who has both receipts gets up to the next window to get his food. And he said, here's these two receipts. I want my food and this woman behind me's food. So he gets both the food, drives off, and the woman gets up there and she's mad and got to start all over again. So we get food. We understand it. And also don't mess with 83-year-old men either. So uh, we get it. Let's look today at one of the most important concepts and idea of Christ as our spiritual food. Guys, this today is not intended to be deep. I want us to sit here today, maybe for 25 or 30 minutes, and reflect on how good we have it in Jesus Christ and what God gave us when He gave us His Son. Simple. Stand with me today. Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 14. This will be the theme of our play on Friday, but... We'll look at one piece of it this morning. Hear now the word of the only living and the only true God. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles were with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. You may be seated. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, today we read this text that says, This is my body, which is given for you. As Christ stood and, and broke the bread. 
Lord, today may we feast upon you. Lord, the psalmist reminded the people as they would sing, Oh, taste and see that the Lord, he is good. Lord, there are many in this room today who have tasted and we have seen. We know your goodness. Lord, we see it day after day. Your strength is what keeps us going. Lord, your faithfulness to us, not our faithfulness to you. Lord, even when we are faithless, you remain faithful. Lord, it is your daily sustenance, Lord, that supplies these needs for us. Lord, I pray today that if there's anyone who hungers, Lord, may he come and be filled. Lord, I pray that he would hunger no more. Lord, I pray that they would come and and see the goodness of our God. Lord, that how much you've loved us, that you would give your son to be broken for us. Lord, that we may partake of you. Lord, we love you in your name. Amen. If you were a Jew, and the idea of drinking blood and eating someone's flesh, it would just be absolutely abhorrent to you. You you can't do that. It's unclean in the law. That means it would bring about death. So the idea that Jesus would literally be telling people that they were going to eat of his flesh and eat and drink of his blood would just be a mind-blowing thought to the Jew. They wouldn't do it. Well, there are people today who teach a doctrine that's called transubstantiation. Everybody say it with me. Repeat it after me. Transubstantiation. All right, we'll work on it. What transubstantiation teaches is this. It's a Catholic doctrine. Transubstantiation teaches that whenever we take of communion, when you and I, as we will do Friday night, we take the bread, when we partake of that bread, on the way down, it literally changes into the body of Christ. Now think about that. Is that the intent of what Jesus is teaching here in Luke 22 and in John 6 and in the Old Testament? Friends, the answer to that is going to be no. When we partake of communion, what we are saying is this. We recognize what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf to die for sins and rise from the dead and by believing in Him, we partake and by belief. His action is credited to mine and your account. We are not saying that we are physically eating the body of Jesus Christ. So make sure that you get that. Everybody good with that? We do not believe in a doctrine called transubstantiation. I said this was going to be easy today and I threw out transubstantiation. Sorry. Uh, All right, let me get off that. What I do want us to see is how Jesus applies this. Turn back with me to John chapter 6. Look with me at John 6. John 6, you might call this, the bread chapter. And if I could remind you where Jesus of Nazareth was born, it wasn't in Nazareth, he was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. And the way I always like to think about it is, when Jesus was in Mary's womb, the bread was in the oven getting ready to come out. So he was the the bread of life born in the house of bread at Bethlehem. But there are two words that are very prominent here in John chapter 6. And the words that are prominent in John chapter 6 are bread and believe. Because the way that you're going to partake of this bread is not through physically eating the body of Christ as a cannibal, but through belief. It is a spiritual sense. It is a spiritual understanding. And it's interesting that Jesus here will begin to feed what we know as the 5,000 early on in John chapter 6. Look at verse 4. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. All right, just stop. When you read things like that in the Bible, the apostles who were divinely inspired are not just wasting their breath, okay? Jesus was going to die as the Passover lamb on the Feast of Passovers. With me? We celebrate Easter right around that time every year that Christ died, He was Passover, He was the unleavened bread buried in the ground, He was the first fruits that rose up out of the grave. That's why we celebrate it in the spring, either late March, early April. Because it's kind of following the pattern of that. Now, I know there are other reasons as to why people think we celebrate Easter when we do. And that's fine. I don't care. But in my mind, we're doing it in a, in a Passover sense to remember that. So think about it. It's Passover time. And Jesus says this. He lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to do what? To test them. For he himself knew what he would do. Well, look down with me at verse 47 in John chapter 6. Jesus, playing on this idea of bread, he feeds the 5,000. 
Jesus performs a miracle where he multiplies the bread and there is so much bread that there are leftovers that people can still come and eat of. Amen? Think about that idea. That's all pointing to Christ in a spiritual sense. He is the bread that never runs out. He is the bread that never gets stale. In commemoration for, our, for my bread sermon today, I, me and Andrea ate at Subway last night. And I ate the first half of the foot long. And then about three hours later, I ate the second half of the foot long. And it wasn't three hours later that the bread was already stale, okay? Jesus is the bread that never gets stale. He is the eternal bread that never runs out and always has enough for all men. Verse 47. Most assuredly, Jesus said, I say to you, he who believes, there's our word, in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, but they're dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not do what? Die. Now that's different. Well, what do you mean we're going to eat of you and never die? Friends, he is the spiritual food that never runs out. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Now friends, the Apostle John is clearly drawing on the Exodus imagery. And I want to remind you so often that the writers of the New Testament are playing on things from the Old Testament. When Jesus says that he is the manna, guess what Exodus 16 and the story about the manna in the wilderness is about? Guess who it's about? Christ. The whole book points to Christ. That's why in Luke 24, Jesus said to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, he began with Moses and the prophets and explained all things that pointed to him in the Old Testament. Friend, it all points to Jesus. Jesus is explaining just that. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Friends, there are many people for the last 2,000 years that have partaken of the bread of Jesus Christ. How do you partake of the bread of Jesus Christ? You believe. And friends, though you may physically die, you spiritually will never be separated from the love of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? I love to read Romans 8 standing over the graveside. Neither life nor death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Friends, we never die. Verse 52. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? You ever notice how the people that didn't believe in Jesus didn't understand it, but the people that did believe in Jesus, he would come and explain it to them? You ever notice that? What a good God. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Imagine if that was physical, friends. It's a spiritual reality. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up the last day. For my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Now if you're a Jew, you are offended. You don't want nothing to do with Jesus of Nazareth. We're not eating anybody's flesh and drinking anybody's blood. So what do you do? You run away. Verse 60. Therefore many of his disciples when they heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? Would that change it? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by the Father. Now watch this, friends. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. People today are not offended when we stand up and say, you've got to eat of Christ and drink his blood. The Jews were offended because they thought it was something physical. People today are offended because they don't want to leave the old life and come and follow Jesus Christ. They don't want to leave every sin behind that they once loved and come and follow Jesus Christ. That's the offense of the gospel. The gospel is offensive, and that's just the way that it is. Why? Because as soon as we hear the gospel, 
the gospel tells me and you that we're wrong. And if you've ever met anybody in my generation, we don't like to be told that we're wrong. But the gospel, at very core, at the very beginning, is a humbling experience. In order for you to come and partake of the bread of life, you have to humble yourself and say, I'm wrong. I was in sin. And therefore, things must change. Notice what Jesus is responded to here in verse 67. Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? And Simon Peter the big mouth says one of the greatest statements in the text. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Is that not good? You ever just think about that? You ever just think about your life and your walk with Jesus Christ and begin to wonder, well, I'm kind of tired of this. And there's some things that are difficult about this life and this walk with Christ Jesus. And then you wake up and you say, well, where else am I going to go? He has the words of eternal life. It would be foolish for me to waste my life to go anywhere else to do other than follow Christ Jesus. Say, so, Zach, that's simple. I know it's simple, but it's profound and it's hard. How many people do you know that have professed Christ and say they love him one day and you look up three months later, a year later, I've seen people join the church and not walk back in it before. I mean, it's unbelievable how hard it is to follow Jesus Christ. We're too busy. We love other things more. You say, Zach, we don't love other things more. Friends, you love what you make time to do. And if we don't make time to worship God, then we have a serious love issue with the Lord. Amen? It, if you are struggling right now and saying, man, you know, it's just a battle for us to get up and go to church every week. Guys, I, I would just want to encourage you fall on your face before God and ask him to help you with that I, I can remember when I was a kid my dad would get up and he would read the Bible in the morning and I would hear him downstairs at like 5 30 and he'd be down there reading and he'd always tell me say Zach you need to get up and read your Bible and it felt like a chore to me it felt like a chore to me that I had to get up and spend time with the Lord how many of you have ever been there don't look at me down your long holy noses okay I know you've been there too but there was a day when something just absolutely changed for me and what changed was my desire to come to the table of the Lord. My desire to read His Word. A desire to be close to Him. A desire to know Him and to love Him. And friends, I don't even think about it as a chore anymore. You know what I do sometimes? And I'll be honest, even as a preacher. There are days, I don't remember the last day I didn't read the Bible, but there, there have been days that if I just think that it's a chore, like it's an obligation, it's something that i got to do, I just don't do it. Because man, I'm, I'm waking up at three o'clock in the morning meditating on the things of God just because it consumes your mind. Friends, do you realize the Bible tells us that we are to meditate on the Word of God? Psalm 1 says that the blessed man meditates on the Word of God. How can you, how can you meditate on something that you're not familiar with? I used to play golf or a basketball game and, or a football game and I would meditate and rehash every play and everything that I did right and everything that I did wrong. We should be able to do that with the Word of God because we spend so much time in it. Some of you feel spiritually starved and skinny. Friends, Jesus said in Matthew 4 that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This Word of God, who is Christ Jesus, is the bread that we feast upon. Let me show you what Jesus was pointing back to. Turn with me to Genesis chapter Excuse me, Exodus chapter 16. Exodus 16 is when Israel is wandering around in the wilderness. The first 40 year Exodus. Jesus claimed in John 6 that he was this true bread that came down from heaven. Exodus chapter 16 beginning in verse 1. And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month, after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. We were slaves. We might have been in spiritual bondage and death, but at least we were full and fat. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. 
the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. And, I shall, and it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Seventh day Sabbath, they would rest on that day. He would provide. Let me just give you three quick basic points. I don't normally do alliteration because I'm not very good at it, but I'm going to give you a little alliteration today. Let me say something about this bread, this manna, who points to Christ Jesus. Number one, this bread is supernatural. You know what that means? You could not sustain yourself on your own. God did something supernatural for them in the Exodus story when he rains this bread down from heaven, however it was, whether how natural or whatever people take it to be, I take it to be a supernatural bread that was appearing for them. And friends, you know what would happen? You know what would happen? They would see this bread and they would ask, what is this? You know why? Because they'd never seen it before. It was something supernatural, just like Jesus' virgin birth, just like Jesus becoming the God-man coming to earth. This was something supernatural that God had to do in order for His people to live. Friends, in order for you to live, God had to send His Son, the true bread, come down from heaven. Secondly, this bread was sufficient. Notice in the Lord's Prayer when it says, Give us this day our what? Jesus is the daily bread that we feast upon. Here for them, the manna, if they tried to take too much of it, it would turn to worms and it would rot. Jesus and God was teaching them that He was sufficient for them, that He would take care of them every single day. Friends, aren't you thankful for God? And can't you look back at your life and say, The Lord has provided for me daily. Christ Jesus was good yesterday. He's good today. And He will be good again tomorrow. How good is that? Just, just salah. Pause and meditate. Think about how good our God is. Supernatural bread. He's sufficient bread. He's all we'll ever need. Do you think we'll ever need another Messiah to come? Why would we? Christ has done it all. His work is finished. He is sufficient. Thirdly, this bread that came down from heaven in the first exodus, there was a period when it ended. There was a period when it stopped coming down. But friends, this bread that we have in the New Testament, this Jesus Christ, He wasn't just good for a 40-year period. Friends, He was good for them, and He's been good for us 2,000 years later. He is ceaseless. You say, Zach, the other two start with an S, and ceaseless starts with a C. What about your alliteration? It's as good as I got, friends. That's all I can do for you. Rookie preachers, that's us. The young ones will get better. But think about it. Christ is ceaseless. This is such a good picture, friends. I want you to see this. You got to get this. This is so good. There was manna that did survive after the Exodus. You know where that manna was? In the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle. The manna was there in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, after Moses and them constructed it. When Solomon builds the temple, the manna was in the Holy of Holies with Aaron's rod that budded and the stone tablets. It was in the Holy of Holies and that manna did not rot. Do you know what that pointed to? That pointed to Christ Jesus, who would be the true bread that came down from heaven, the true manna that would enter the Holy of Holies on our behalf and He would bring us into the Holy of Holies with Him that we would feast on Him forever. That's the glory of God. You say, Zach, I don't believe you. I'm from Missouri. Show me. Okay, I will. Hebrews chapter 9. Let's go there. What a beautiful picture that we would have access to this bread forever. Do you realize only the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies in the Old Covenant system? He's the only one that after that 40-year Exodus period had access to that bread. But now in the New Covenant, you and I have been brought back into the presence of God. The true salvation because of Jesus. And friends, you and I, we feast upon Him eternally. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in earthly sanctuary. For the tabernacle was prepared... First part, in which was the lampstand, the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the Holy of Holies, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, 
Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak now in detail. Friends, I wish with all of my heart that they would have spoken in detail right there about those things. <laughs> Verse 6. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle, that temple, was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience, concerned only with food, drinks, and various washings and fleshly ordinances until the time of reformation. But Christ, friends, came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and the more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. Friends, Christ's spiritual work interceding was in a spiritual tabernacle, not with the blood of goats and bulls and calves, but with His own blood. He entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of a heifer sprinkling by unclean sanctifies for the purifying of flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who threw Himself eternal, the Spirit, offered Himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Friends, can I just explain this to you just quickly? Jesus Christ gave us access to come and eat in the presence of God. Though we were dead and worthless sinners who had no business pulling up to the seat of the table, you and I can now pull up and sit and eat at the communion table with God whenever we want to because Christ Jesus went behind the veil and He made us perfect in Him and gave us access to the King. Is that not the good news? You remember that random story in the Old Testament about a guy named Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth was... A, rela- uh, a relative of King Saul related to Jonathan. David had gone through and was killing all of Saul's relatives because they were going to be a threat to his throne. But do you remember Mephibosheth? He was lame. He couldn't walk. He couldn't do anything. And all of a sudden, he comes to David. And you know what David says? You can do nothing of yourself, but you will eat at my table every single day. Jesus Christ is the true and better David that allows us, the Mephibosheths, to come and pull up and eat at his table and commune with him. In his presence. Let me close today back in the Old Testament. Turn with me to Genesis 40 and I'll finish. The idea of bread was everywhere in the Old Testament. It all pointed to Christ. And I can't think of a greater story that would point to our communion elements and communion table other than the story of Joseph. You might remember Joseph was thrown in a pit by his brothers, they rejected him as ruling over them and giving a judgment. Joseph rose out of the pit. He was sold into slavery, into prison. And notice what happens to him in prison. Genesis chapter 40, beginning in verse 1. It came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended the Lord, the king of Egypt. You ever just read something in the Bible and you're like, I know where this is going. Like, but you've got to know a little bit about the right side of the book to go back and read the left side of the book to know where this is going. Because you know what a baker does for a king? He's in charge of all of his agricultural stuff. And he's the one that takes the bread and brings the bread to the king that he eats. You know what the butler does to the king? He's the one responsible for the wine. And what are the communion elements? Bread and wine. And these who controlled the king's bread and wine are now in prison with Joseph. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers and the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them and served them so that they were in custody for a while. Think about this, friends. Pharaoh's cupbearer and king, cupbearer and his baker were placed under the authority of Joseph. Verse chapter 41. I want you to flip over there with me. Look at Genesis 41, verse 39. Y'all don't want me to read the whole chapter to you. Joseph interprets the dreams. Joseph is raised up out of the pit. Joseph is raised up to Pharaoh and seated at the right hand. 
Sound familiar? Story of Christ. Joseph. Jesus is the true and better Joseph. Verse 39. I'm almost done. Stay with me. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and as wise as you. You shall be over my house. All my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Verse 46. Watch this. Joseph was how many years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, at his right hand? 30. How old was Jesus when he started his ministry? And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. Joseph gathered much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting for it was immeasurable. Let me put it to you this way. Joseph came to his brothers. His brothers rejected him. They threw him in a pit. He rises out of the pit and he goes and ascends to sit at the right hand of Pharaoh where he would replace the baker and the cupbearer. Where he would replace the bread and the wine. He would be in charge and sit at the right hand. People would have to come to Joseph and eat and Joseph had so much food that nobody would ever hunger again when they came to him. Do you see Christ all over the Old Testament, friends? It all points to Him. Jesus is saying, when He comes to the Last Supper, He said, friends, the Old Covenant system is done away with. I am the bread. I am the blood. The New Covenant is in Me. And friends, you better come to Christ. Because He, number one, is supernatural. Number two, He is sufficient. And three, He is ceaseless. How many of you today could stand up and testify and say, Zach, I have never spiritually hungered since coming to Christ. It's my testimony, and I think it's yours too. Let's pray.